committee uh, with members present in the room and by Starleaf. Uh, the clerk has received apologies from nobody at this stage, so we're just, um, I think, saw Trevor online, so he, he might here. come back to this again. Uh, Emma, George, and Martina are online, so we're just Christopher that we're waiting on, who should be with us in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of item two, the draft minutes, uh, the minutes uh, of the meeting that were held on the 25th of November at page five of the pack. Just to remind members that we agreed last week that those would be approved in the interim by myself so that we could include them in the Brexit reports. So those minutes have been agreed, but are there any glaring issues or problems with that that anybody wants to highlight? Okay. Um, my, item three matters arising. Um, the debate on the committee's report on the evidence received from the councils is on the provisional order paper for Tuesday the 15th of December at 3.30. Um, so that committee motion has been accepted by the business committee and is on the agenda then for uh, Tuesday the 15th of December. In page three of the table papers, there's correspondence from the House of Lords European Union Committee to Minister Michael Gove highlighting the lack of clarity around the implementation of some key elements of the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland and the potential economic impact on Northern Ireland. The House of Lords Committee has asked Minister Gove for an urgent update on the issues raised, including the current status of relevant discussions in the Joint Committee. Are members content to note that correspondence? No. Oh. Yeah. Uh, um, yes, Martina? Yeah, we should note it and we should also um, take account of what we're hearing uh, in relation to this finance bill at Westminster next week that again is going to break international law if our courts are right and overturn uh, and overrule the protocol. So I think might, we might need to do more than note that. We need, might need to take some action because we're going to need information. Uh, if that is the case, maybe before next Wednesday's meeting, if it's going to go to Westminster before our next meeting. Okay. Um, in your hands as to what action should we write back to them and ask them for their assessment of, or? Yeah, yeah. I think we should ask for a information if we're going to have another breach of international law, if they're going to break the protocol, if they're going to put. Um, contain some kind of clauses that is going to ensure that it means that the protocol is not going to work as was agreed by the British government. Then once again, you know, we're going to see the Brexit talks negotiations that are supposed to be ending this week in crisis. Back to Michael Gove. Uh, yeah, just cl clarifying, Clark suggesting here that we write to Michael Gove on that. Would that be... I think we need, we need to raise it with the um, with the TEO committee or, or TEO ministers, executive ministers, as well as we should write to uh, to the British government express or to Michael Gove expressing our concerns and asking for information. It could be all speculation. Let's hope it is. But if we get a financial bill at Westminster that's going to do what the rumour says that it's supposed to be going to do, then that's um, that's going to be another difficulty um, as we head over the cliff. At the end of uh, of this year, in a few weeks' time. Okay, I, I suppose, as you say, given that it's it's not likely, it's not I think, been presented until later in the week. But at least if we send off now, we'll be certainly suggesting that we will be uh, that we're seeking that information in advance of of what is being considered. So, okay, we can do that. Right. Um, then uh, members content to note that for the for all the, that action from there. Agreement. Okay, item four is the Executive Office work strands under new decade, new approach, the oral evidence session with departmental officials. Um, just to inform members that the department notified the clerk this morning that there was a question mark over whether a briefing paper for the NDNA session could be provided in time for the meeting. In the absence of a briefing paper being provided within the agreed time frame as set out in the protocol, time scales for interaction between assembly committees and departments, I took the decision to remove the item from the agenda. Um, I have to say, I'm just, I'm really disappointed uh, with this. It's a continual process that we are not getting the papers from um, officials, but I'm conscious on two separate levels. Number one, in order for us to interrogate and scrutinize, which is what our role as a committee is, we need to have the information to be able to read the information in advance and to do our preparation to be able to ask that 
So having the department contacting us at half 10 and 11 of a day to say that there's maybe problems over getting that information uh, is no use. Even if they were to come back with it at 12 o'clock, it still means that we don't have enough time to be able to scrutinise that. Um, likewise, in the next item, um, it was due to be an oral briefing. We downgraded that at the advice and, and request of um, the department to a written briefing so that it could be considered today as a written briefing. But as you can see from your papers, that was only received this morning uh, at 11 o'clock. Now, the only thing that is in their favour on that and why I have allowed that to continue on to the agenda today is the fact that it's so lacking in information and it's only two pages. It will not take very long to scrutinise it uh, and we can have our, our conversation about it. But um, I think that we should be writing to the department explaining that you know our role is established to be a scrutiny role. We give people enough notice. They should at least come back to us and say we're not going to be able to fulfil that in a week's time and we're not being left on the morning of a committee meeting unable uh, to provide an item on the agenda. And whilst this might sound harsh, my perspective on it is quite clear. If we ask for information as a scrutiny committee and we don't get that information, it says to me two things. One, either they don't want to give us the information or two, that they've got something to hide. Because otherwise they would give us the information and we would uh, perform our scrutiny role. But it is becoming increasingly difficult because just about every presentation that we get from the department, the papers are only arriving the day before or the morning of the uh, committee. And, and that just, it can't happen. It's hampering our work. So would members agree that we send correspondence to the First and Deputy First Minister and ask them, please, that we receive the information in a timely manner? Would members agree with that? Agree. Chair. Yes. Chair, whilst I agree uh, with that uh, that proposal, I also think we should take note of what the two junior ministers said to us last week. They seem frustrated that we're getting the papers late. Yeah. They have talked to their officials. They have brought it up with the officials, and I got the impression that uh, the two junior ministers uh, were at least indicating. It wasn't the fault of the ministers, <clears throat> but they were getting quite frustrated that we were getting these papers late. So I think we should at least be mindful and record that we have taken account of what the junior ministers have said to the committee and how they have raised it with officials as well. And, uh, and that we acknowledge that they seem to be trying to get us the papers in time. But I do agree, we cannot scrutinise getting papers at lastminute.com. But uh, I don't know about the rest of you. It's not just the only committee that this happens in. Well, it's maybe a reasonable point. Maybe what we should do in our letter is we should seek clarity on why we're not getting papers on time. And then if, it, if there can be an explanation given. I say, uh, from a chairperson's perspective, I would have no issues if on thursday or friday of last week they said we're not going to be able to get that to you and we would have time to, to to schedule something else but essentially in about 15 minutes we're going to go into our only item of business for the today in a closed session uh, and like a, a half hour meeting is not exactly sent out to the public a very um you know a, a great message that we're actually engaging in, in in worthwhile work but if they can tell us in advance that they're not going to be able to do something we could reschedule other items onto the agenda or bring forward presentations from other outside organizations that would allow us um, to be able to do to do that scrutiny work trevor yeah, i'm just wondering chair who, who would sign off on these papers before they come to us would it be the chief and uh, the Joint first ministers have to see them, <coughs> send them off. I would, I would suspect so, but so the, the junior ministers, it's not, it's not their fault. They are they blaming the officials or are they obliquely blaming their bosses? Well, I, let's not go to the blame game just yet. Let's just go no, to the let's not. clarify <laughs> role. Could I suggest that we seek clarification around that? Who's Responsible for supplying papers, yeah, who's good, responsible for signing off on them, and you know if we can do that, we can then determine where the hold up is. Um, you know, I, I've spoken, I've spoken to Declan in particular about this, and he's adamant that the fault doesn't lie with them. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, but let's find out for definite who it is, where the hold up is. 
And there, there's always a happy medium to these things insofar as, you know, from other committee experiences, Pat and myself sit, for example, on the Health Committee, which can run to six hours or seven hours a day. You know, we're, we're at the other end of the scale of running very short because we're not getting the, the, the work to, to scrutinise. So, and, you know, and the clerk works their absolute best to be able to deliver a timetable and a forward work programme that has the information in it. But if, if two hours, three hours before a committee meeting to say, we can come to your committee and present, but we don't have anything to present to you. Well, there's no point in them being here because we're going to direct that anger, in a sense, at, at that process, at those officials who are going to say, we don't know, we can't say, we're unsure. And that's not fair on them either. But I think it's important that we have that clarity. So I'm getting agreement from members that we seek that clarity. And, at the very and least, Chair, it's disrespectful to the committee that, you know, if papers aren't going to arrive in time, we don't get sufficient notice to put something else on our agenda. Uh, it's it's unacceptable. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can I say that as someone who has two committees on the, the same day, which mean like you're, all of you who are workaholics and will stay up late at night and will read our papers and will get up early in the morning and do what we have to do, either to get the committee or get on in Starleaf if we can't all be in the room. Um, but you cannot run out of one committee at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, uh, and then get papers late and have an opportunity to read them, absorb them, um, in order to come in prepared to the committee. And I know there are probably others that maybe even their committee, sometimes my committee runs up to one o'clock and after. So I just feel that um, I concur with what you're saying. If we, we want to scrutinize properly, we want to do our work. I would stay here to 10 o'clock tonight if we had the work to do and we needed to do that. Um, but you know, for now, us can end the closed session in 15 minutes time. It's a waste of my afternoon that I could have scheduled other things to do. Yes, <clears throat> Chair, I agree with, uh, with what Martina has just said in terms of the economy committee today sat for about three hours and you're coming out, so you're getting out of one committee at sort of 10 past, quarter past one. It's quite routine that that committee would run for that sort of time. You're getting out at 10 past, quarter past one to then come here at two o'clock. If there's nothing on, if I had known there was nothing on, there are other things. Like my constituency is obviously on the doorstep of Stormont, so there are other things I could have been, Pat's the same, I'm sure. There are other things that I could have been doing today. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I agree. It is, it's not very respectful towards the, the function of this committee and the work that it does, that we should be treated in that way. And just finally, the key point that both Martina and yourself have made, there's no point in them sending us a paper at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning if members are in other committees. That's because right. How are you going to get a chance to read the paper then? You know, it either, you know, if it's not in by the Friday, I think we need to maybe as a committee review that in, in January and say, look, if something's not in by the Friday, then that's it. It drops automatically from the agenda and we make an effort to try and replace it with something else so that members' time is filled and we can get papers to people on a Monday that they then have a bit of time to be able well, like, to prepare I mean, for. I, I served at Belfast Council for 11 years. You wouldn't be allowed to table an item in the council mm -hmm. in that way. Like, that just would not be accepted. So if it's not acceptable at local government, it's not acceptable up here either. I'll also mention it. At, oh, yes, George. That. No, <clears throat> just uh, uh, agreeing entirely with uh, Christopher. It's, uh, it's just disrespectful, I think, to to the committee and to the committee members. And like somebody like myself, who fortunately I can uh, work from Starleaf, but if I had to drive up there, you know, um, an hour and a half or so, your days your days wasted. Basically, as Christopher says, there's. Plenty of constituency work that we could be getting, getting on with. Very, very disrespectful, I think, quite honestly. Also, just I did mention that there's a protocol there, which is actually um, the executive office is 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 look. It's the one that looked the custodian of the protocol between uh, the the work between the speaker here and 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 the executive office. But it's been five years from it. Um, has been looked at, so it may be something that I might mention at the Chairman's Liaison Forum, just so that to see if there's commonality <coughs> across um, other committees and whether that's a, a, a protocol that might need reviewed on behalf of all backbench members to be able to ensure that we have bits and pieces to, to pursue. But members, thank you very much for that. I think we've we've gone to where we are with it. Um, we can... What about rescheduling? Oh yes, do, we do need to re reschedule that uh, presentation. So are members happy that we seek to reschedule that at some point? Okay, yeah. that's a great.
Uh, okay, members, item five, historical institutional abuse engagement with institutions, the departmental written briefing. Um, department officials were scheduled, as I said, to provide an oral briefing today. At last week's meeting, it was agreed at the request of the department to postpone the oral briefing until early 2021 and instead receive a written briefing. A date for the uh, oral briefing has been identified, but the department is yet to confirm. On page six of the table pack today, the written briefing is there. It was received at 10 to 11 this morning, so apologies to those that were in uh, meetings this morning. Um, so it's there. Are there any queries or points to raise on that? Yeah, Chair, thanks. Listen, not much on this because, in, in truth, there's not much there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a, a pointless statement, if I'm really honest. But just so, um, Chair, I, I've been lobbied, and I think other uh, members might have been lobbied also by some of the victims' groups, and they're asking, uh, and they've spoken to the, the Minister for Communities, and they're asking for uh, a funeral fund to be set up uh, within the support services, and that's for those people who are... Uh, who have been abused, who haven't yet gone through the redress system, um, but but who pass away before they go through that, and a fund that would therefore help to pay for the funeral costs. Uh, they've been doing it on a ad hoc basis at this moment in time, um, with the likes of the Rosetta Trust and, and, and others sort of paying for this, and other, and other kind people paying for this. Um, but I think the state pays about a thousand pounds towards a funeral. Mm. But, but a funeral has cost is about five thousand, maybe even closer to six thousand pounds. So they're they're asking, um, and I know that the, the, the minister for communities uh, is going to write to the TEO office on that. But but I just wonder if we can add our voice of support to that. I don't think it'd be many, but I think it would be something just to know it's there. That money could be drawn down to pay for that. I, I think would 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 be good. I think it's a small ask, a, a sensible ask. Sure, just in, in, in terms of this paper, I mean, you could sum it up saying, well, nothing really to tell you. Uh, and, uh, I mean, we're talking about this for how long now, about the institutions making a contribution to the compensation fund. I mean, it's, it, it's not a big deal. Let us know where the, where the, what progress has been made, what meetings have taken place. Uh, or you know what meetings have taken place between lawyers, but I mean, that's it's a waste of five minutes. Really, to be honest. I mean, and there is a, a again from a democratic perspective, which we have to be the custodians of. There is a bit of a linear sort of movement here, insofar as we are all as parties and as individuals being asked about this. There are questions that are regularly asked during question time in the House, but we're being told in the question time and the answers that this is ongoing, that negotiations are, are happening, that there will be conclusions soon. We're the committee that provides the scrutiny. We can't get the people in front of us to give a scrutiny. I think I've raised it. I think I've raised the issue in terms of um, the institutions making a contribution here and yep. on the floor of the Assembly at least twice. Uh, you know, so four times in total, twice here and twice in the assembly, and it's getting to the. I mean, it's getting to the point where you know you nearly go directly to the institutions themselves and ask them. You know, so I, I do think it is important that people know what's coming. The state obviously has a huge responsibility in terms of making uh, recompense to these people because ultimately. It was the state that handed innocent people over to these institutions, but these institutions also have an obligation. And I just worry that games are being played and you know clocks are being run down and stuff like that. And I just don't think that would be right. Okay. And, and again, asking a few questions of officials would give us an enlightenment to yes. that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt that the request came from the committee to hold back to the new year because I feel that they had a sense that, that something of substance would be there but if I felt that they were asking to wait until the new year because they just don't have anything to tell us and they're hoping by then that they will have something, yes. that is a different story and would be totally unacceptable so um, using my better nature I'll hope that it means When that did you acquire that? that uh, <laughs> uh, I've had it all it's Christopher uh, that, uh, Yes Martina? Um, as I said before, as the junior minister who had the honour and privilege um, to establish the historical institutional abuse inquiry, um, you know, I feel that as we sit here now at the end of 2020, 
and we still don't have information with regards to the institutions, the other institutions who should be uh, making some kind of a contribution uh, towards these victims. Um, I think that in itself, yes, we need, of course, the officials in front of us to see how far that has been pushed and interrogated. And I believe the, that has been ongoing and ongoing issue. And uh, I think, as Christopher said, uh, they may be running down the clock. But, you know, we don't need officials in front of us to hear that that's the state of play. We know that that is the state of play. And what we need is a strong call out to these institutions that they do have a responsibility to care for these victims. These victims, and it is appalling to think that even something like a funeral fund, and I know related to that, that some of the victims have also lobbied us when there was a memorial being spoken about, because they have said that unfortunately, the in those institutions who could not cope and survive with what happened to them, and some of them took their lives, and some of them died alone without having anyone around them or with them or to bury them. And there are some of them that don't even have headstones. And they were saying that they would prefer such a fund like that was going to the headstones to mark the graves of those who have died and, and are lying on unmarked graves. So I just think the seriousness of this, um, it is absolutely appalling. As someone who left as a junior minister with an inquiry on their way and to come back and the institutions have not declared because if they declared we would know that that they intend to make uh, to, to make some contribution to the victims i just think that that is unacceptable at every level and it is now beyond time that uh, i think we need to call that out yes we need officials and we need to know we know what the state is doing and and rightly so everything that christopher said is absolutely right and appropriate but we also need to know what these institutions are doing and they don't have a good rec track record of, uh, of taking care, unfortunately, of such victims. OK, thank you. And maybe just to, to say as well, as you know, I think our, they've had the department, I feel, has had their one go of saying, can we hold off and we'll come back to you with something it, they've proved here that they haven't. So I think that ability to, to ask um, for, you know, can, to be given time to go off and do something, I think they've kind of used it. So, um, okay, um, the 13th of January is the date that has been identified for um, the, the, the come back to this. The officials haven't confirmed that yet, but we will maybe go back to them and just remind them that that's the time that we've set aside for them to come to us on that. So, so sorry, Joe, can I just maybe just close this a little bit? Can we write to the executive office and, and give that support to? to that funeral fund that, that's coming from the executive office. And I will forward this to you now, yeah, Maria, yeah. and then you, you, you'll, you'll have that. Yeah. Just, I mean, just a support letter, really. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, members, item six, forward work programme. On that stage, very quick. Uh, page 110 of the meeting pack. Um, we've just said that there's a departmental oral briefing scheduled for the 13th of January as well on the assessment of the impact on Brexit and the institutions and the north-south-east-west relationships as it was committed under NDNA. Department of officials have advised that given the uncertainties that remain around the implementation of the protocol and the outcome of negotiations, they will not know the impact of Brexit until sometime in 2021. Uh, they have said that there will be nothing to brief on at the start of January as the work on the assessment won't have started. Um, so. In a letter that was received from the department on the 7th of October, they stated that, and I quote from them, in this EU exit transition period, discussions are ongoing on many areas that could have an impact on the institutions in the north, south and east, west relationships. What I'm going to suggest to members is that we ask the officials to come along and provide that briefing for, at the very least, they could provide us with a briefing on the discussions that they had about the impact of Brexit on all of those areas, as opposed to maybe having a definitive outcome of what the actual impacts will be, because obviously after 13 days, they won't know what the actual impacts are going to be. So are members happy that we ask them for that presentation uh, and we can examine what preparations they've been making, what are the headline items that they may have been uh, thinking are going to be the outcomes and what mitigations that they would have put in place. So would members be happy if we proceed with that? 
Chair, I, I think we might know what some of the outcomes, 13 days after, you know, we're over a cliff, um, maybe without a parachute, uh, because we might, mightn't even have the protocol if they're going to do the damage that this finance bill is going to do, as well as the internal market bill. So we might be actually in the middle of uh, just seeing it all unfolding in front of us, mess after mess. So um, I, I do, yeah, I concur with what you're saying, but I, I do think that we may need emergency meetings. Um, we might need other meetings to, to deal with the fallout from Brexit um, when we go into the new year. Yep, I think it's quite right. If we're going to go over a cliff edge without a parachute, I'm sure there will at least have been some conversations about how you will work out how you're mm -hmm. going to land. So I think if we can have them along as opposed to just waiting, as the suggestion might be, wait until June and we'll see where we are at that stage. I don't think that provides us with much of an opportunity to scrutinise. So, um, OK, but I'm getting a sense that members are happy with that. Um, um, just we're noting then just the rest of the forward work programme if members are happy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in correspondence, you have 10 items from pages 116 to 262 and three items at page 10 to page 20. Um, item 7.1 at page 116 is a response from the Minister of State on behalf of the Secretary of State, um, who, who must be too busy to write to us, to the committee's letter seeking views on the particular challenges being faced by councils in border areas and asking why the NIO refused a meeting request from Fermanagh and Oma District Council. Uh, now, we're still waiting on a response from the Northern Ireland office, but there is a response there from, uh, from Minister Walker uh, detailing some of the interactions that there were between the two. Are members happy enough to note the comments that he's made there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Item 7.2 uh, on page 120 is a letter from the Speaker. Correspondence is about the that the Assembly Commission has received a formal request from the Public Service Ombudsman to commence Part 3 of the Public Service Ombudsman Act Northern Ireland 2016 to enable her to exercise a complaints standard authority rule. Um, the Speaker is inviting the views of our committee um, because this is the committee that will provide the scrutiny. It previously was the committee of the first Deputy First Minister and then taken up in 2016 by the Executive Office Committee. As we're being asked for our views on something that we have yet to receive a presentation or information on, would members be happy if we invite the Ombudsman to a committee meeting to brief members on the complaint standard rule that the Speaker's Office is advised uh, and that the Speaker's Act Office is advised of the action taken? Would members be happy with that? Okay. Uh, item 7.5, page 127, is a copy of correspondence from the Committee for the Economy to the First and Deputy First Minister regarding a briefing it received on the business preparedness for the end of the EU transition period. The Committee is asking that full resources be applied to the media campaign to make local businesses aware of what they need to do now to prepare for the end of the transition period. As that communication role is something that would fall within the Executive Office, would members be content that we write as a committee to the Executive Office and concur with the Department for Economy's suggestion that there's good communication with the businesses uh, in advance of the end of the year? Would members be happy with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, item 7.11 on page 10 of the committee of the table pack is a written statement from the First and Deputy First Minister regarding the appointment of Jenny Piper as interim head of the civil service. Might I suggest to the committee that Ms Piper is invited to attend the committee meeting in the new year to give an introductory briefing? Agreed. Okay. Uh, then if members want to note the remaining item of correspondence. Item 8, Chairman's Business Members, uh, just to let you know that yesterday the Chairs of the Economy, Health and Communities Committees met to discuss uh, a range of issues being faced by students because of COVID pandemic. It was agreed that consideration would be given to issuing a joint letter on behalf of the four committees to the First and Deputy First Minister to call for a coordinated approach across the Executive to address these issues and to ensure that the Executive works collaboratively to support students through what is an exceptionally difficult time. Um, there is a draft on page 22 of the table pack of the joint letter and if members are in agreement um, I will sign that and send it on behalf of the committee along with other committee chairs. Members are great. Okay. Uh, any other business from members? <coughs> okay. So then the date, time, and place of the next meeting is next Wednesday, the 9th of December, at 2 o'clock here. 
Uh, I'm just required to make the following announcement that members, we are now going to move into closed session for the remainder of the meeting. Uh, could I ask that the communications to add all members into the spotlight and to note that we'll be in closed session for around 40, moment, 40 moments, 40 minutes. Uh, to <coughs> get just do I press this. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.